Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very, very special video because I have a fragrance that has absolutely knocked me out and I'm very excited to bring this review to you because sometimes, you know, it feels like the hand of fate just sort of moves in. The invisible hand of fate comes in and says, Ramsey, it's time to talk about this fragrance or that fragrance because I honestly, I don't have a plan when I do these. Um, which video I do on this day or that day is usually just decided on how I feel that day. You know, I'm not that organized where I have some sort of a plan. All I try to do really is mix in the fragrances. So I try not to do too many individual reviews at once or too many perfumer portfolios back to back to back or, you know, too many this is not a top 10 or I just try and sort of mix and match and give a... Um, you know, a, a balanced offering to you guys. That's really what I'm trying to do. And I want to give you the quality content that I know I can put out and share my passion and love of fragrances with you guys. That's the whole point of this channel because this is not how I put food on the table, okay? This is uh, a hobby for me and uh, something that I really do love doing. And it's funny though, the way that sometimes things work out. That's why I say the invisible hand of fate sometimes steps in. And you just have to sort of go with the flow because about a week ago, my brother Rich Mitch uh, was saying, hey, I've got these Grossmith samples and I'm going to do some early impression videos on it. And he has since done some early impression videos on his channel. He has done three videos on the house of Grossmith. I would urge you to go check his thoughts out. And, you know, for a guy who does not like florals, he spoke very highly of the house of Grossmith. And so um, that tells you just how quality of a house it is. And I am in agreement and then some with uh, how I feel about this perfume. So a couple things I have to say first. Big thank you to Jeff. So Jeff very kindly sent me some uh, bottles. Uh, very, very kindly. Some of them actually were were uh, are extremely hard to find and or expensive if you can find them. But he recently sent me this. I mean, he sent me a care package. And this was inside of the package, um, a bottle of Norn by Slumber House, which I think I'm going to wear maybe on Friday of this week um, because I have not worn this as my scent of the day yet. Mmm, man. Somebody said that this fragrance feels like sort of a early iteration of a Pine Ward fragrance. Pine Ward is a house I really like, and I've got a ton of samples, so I will be doing more Pine Ward videos soon. I do have one video on the channel from the House of Pine Ward. Go check them out if you're interested in this type of perfumery. But uh, it, it really does. It feels like a, you know, the juice looks like a Serge Luton juice color. It's deep and dark and, um, you know, I don't have any experience with the House of Slumber House. I've never talked about them on the channel, I don't think. Um, and this is the only bottle I have thanks to Jeff. So he very kind, kindly sent me this along with a couple other samples, which I also love. One was Dior's Vetiver. I really, I, I, after wearing that to bed, I want a bottle. I'll tell you that it's really, really good. And I know the, the bottles of Dior Vetiver are getting harder and harder to come by, but, uh, and he sent me this and he told me that per mil, this is the most expensive fragrance of the bunch. And I'm not 100% sure because uh, I think he said this came from a vintage bottle, meaning before the days that the current husband and wife combination of the house of Grossmith London um, stepped in and revitalized the house about, uh, I think it was like 12 or 13 years ago, give or take. I don't know 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure on the backstory, but I do know that... Um, the House of Grossmith, I'll give you a little bit of background. It was actually one of Great Britain's oldest perfume houses, and they owe its current existence to a important coincidence in the fragrance industry. The brand was basically given a second life. Okay, here we go. They're going to go a little bit into it. So it says that they date back to the 19th century when John Grossmith's family opened a ravishing small perfume house in London in 1835. We're going way back. Uh, fragrances such as Victorian Bouquet from 1897, English Lilac from 1920. The label was successful until the Second World War. And then in 1940, Grossmith had to close due to the war. So after the war, Simon Brooke, the great, great grandson of the company's founder, accidentally found the documents, formulas, and Baccarat bottles 
of the former fragrance house. Of particular interest was the long tradition of celebrating royal events. So it was only logical but only tempting to breathe new life into the Grossmith brand. Speaking of celebrating royal events, they made a fragrance for King Charles's, um, uh, the coronation of H.M. King Charles III. They made a fragrance this year called King Salute, which is made for men. They make very few fragrances for men. But that's uh, supposed to be like a spicy, uh, aromatic fougere. I would love to smell that one day. That is high on my to-sniff list. Um, and anyways, so um, in the Floral Green Women's Fragrance, uh, Betrothal appeared in 2011. So 2011, I think, is when the house was... Um, originally revived by 2016 another seven fragrances and two seven women's fragrances and two unisex fragrances followed a team of eight hand-picked perfumers worked together to create the new Grossmith fragrances some of the aromas were modifications of old formulas with a newer twist and rumor is that Roja Dove actually had a played a part in getting the Grossmiths together with Robertette rumor is Roja uses Robertet perfumers, and I believe Grossmith uses Robertet perfumers as well. That's the rumor, anyways. Uh, allegedly. Do not hold me to that, but that's allegedly the rumor that's floating around. And the flacons remain unchanged in terms of shape and design. Knowingly, they were created specifically for the 21st century reissue. For fragrance lovers around the globe, Grossmith stands for craftsmanship, authenticity, and luxury. Beauty portals, drugstores, Douglas, mail order companies, and of course, the labels homepage are the ultimate destinations when searching for Grossmith fragrances. Okay, so I think Jeff was telling me, and do leave a comment, Jeff, and let me know below, but I think he was telling me that this juice that I'm smelling comes from a bottle of Hasu no Hana. That's the name of the fragrance we're going to be looking at today. Hasu no Hana from 1888, this is. And if you know your fragrance history, that's a very important year. We'll talk about that at the end of the video. Um, but he told me that this bottle, this juice right here, the reason it's so expensive is it comes from a vintage bottle before this new reissue of the brand. So if that's true, this is absolutely stunning. And, and if this is the new stuff that you can buy right now, I mean, holy shit, I, I'm almost ready to go buy a bottle. Um, <sighs> um, okay, so let me try my best to describe this fragrance to you. It's very complex, but in a nutshell, I think I'll be able to sort of give you the picture of, of what I'm smelling. So you have to remember a couple of things. I have been blessed to smell some amazing, some of the best fragrances in the world. Um, that's my goal in this hobby is I want to smell the greatest fragrances ever created. And, you know, I want to collect some of the greatest fragrances ever in, in, in my collection. And so as a perfume addict, I have been very fortunate in that I feel like I've really been able to accomplish a lot of that goal and smell some of the all-time great. So I have a little bit of a frame of reference of vintage perfume. Vintage perfume is where my heart truly is. You know, I do love some of the niche stuff. I love some of the designers. You know, there's a lot of things in the perfume world that I love. I'm just a perfume junkie. But... Um, my, my heart is with the vintage stuff. I mean, if you said, Ramsey, you get to keep, you know, 10 fragrances, you can bet your bottom dollar that most of them would be vintage. Uh, you know, I would keep the Mitsukos of the world in the Shalimars and the, uh, vintage heritages and all that good stuff. I would keep all that stuff. Uh, that, those would be my keepers. Vintage Quid de Russie by Chanel. Those type of fragrances are the ones that really move me. This is in that category. And I have smelled some absolutely unbelievable iris in my time. I've been very fortunate to smell some amazing iris. Thanks in part to my good friend Russian Adam who sent me a pure um, iris that was had 85% irones, he said. And I think you'll see a lot of fragrance houses brag like Francesca Bianchi on her website. I once read in one of her fragrances, she said, and the Oris butter that we use here had 15% irones, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. So she's touting 15% irones as, as she should. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, 85% irones is like unheard of, right? Like the best iris on earth. And that's what this reminded me of in the opening. It has this unbelievable sort of vintage powdery 
beauty to it. I mean, it's like a literal vintage beauty. Like you're staring at a member of, of you know, like the royal family from the 1920s, decked out in the most beautiful outfit you've ever seen, right? And you're just in awe, just staring, right, at, at, the, at the beauty of, of the duchess of this place or the count of that or what, whatever it is, right? But you're just starstruck right? That's the feeling of the opening of this fragrance. I mean, it literally left me speechless. I, and I've, and I've had this in my collection. You can go watch my unboxing video when I unboxed, um, Norn and Dior's Vetiver in, in the decant. And, and of course this little beauty right here, I have worn this to bed every single day since I've got this. I have been obsessed with this. I came home and, you know, I've been sort of saving these individual reviews for when I'm working from home or sometimes it's a little easier. I came straight home and put this on again for the third time. I'm like, I have to wear this again. It is absolutely captivating, absolutely captivating. And um, the iris opening, I mean, literally speechless, unbelievable, that powdery uh, iris is an old school style, not the modern Dior all makeup y style iris cosmetic y. This is like this vintage, just pure beauty. And um, this fragrance is supposed to basically represent so Hasu no Hana is the name of the fragrance again. And Hasu no Hana is supposed to represent the beauty of the Japanese water lily. Okay, so um, interestingly enough, and we talked a little bit about this on the channel in previous episodes. If you follow the channel, this is not a new discussion. But um, there was a fragrance called Jiki from the House of Guerlain, which happened to come out one year after Hasu no Hana, if the dates are all correct. And Jiki is, is colloquially known as the uh, first modern perfume. Perfume that takes an abstract concept construct and gives it to you, the audience, right? It, it's not something that smells like a rose or jasmine or honeysuckle or geranium, you know, or whatever it is. Um, back then, those were the type of fragrances that came out. It would be Narcissus or, you know, something like that. Um, Ylang Ylang or, you know, that's what they did. They just tried to reconstruct the smell of a daffodil or whatever flower that they picked that they, that, you know, the fragrance was supposed to smell like, or they would just say, here's some civet, you know, here's civet. You want to wear something different? Wear civet. Uh, wear, wear plain civet paste. Um, and Jiki changed that. And so to ha for this fragrance to supposed to smell or be representative of the Japanese water lily makes a lot of sense because that's how old style fragrances back then were done. It was very common for fragrances to try to smell like something real in nature, not necessarily this abstract smell. And I don't know if they necessarily hit the mark because I don't have a water lily to compare it to, but I can tell you that... Um, the water lily itself is, if you've ever just Google Japanese water lily and look at the beautiful, brilliant pictures of these flowers, they grow in either mud or on water. Usually like you'll see them floating on top of the water and in, in, in pools and lakes and stuff like that. Uh, and I recently did a video where Japanese water lily actually got some limelight within the last week or two. It was the Bortnikoff Lucky Oud video. And that particular video, I was, I was highlighting this flower because Bortnikoff is a master. He's, he's a master magician at sort of implementing these flowers, which you're just not used to smelling in most Western perfume. You know, a lot of Western perfume, you'll see uh, Ylang Ylang, Rose, Jasmine, you know, or something like that, or Lily of the Valley, right? Lily of the Valley, Rose, Jasmine, Ylang Ylang. There's your floral bouquet. That's the classic French bouquet. And the Japanese water lily is something different. Uh, and so Bortnikoff gave us that in Lucky Oud, and I talked a little bit about that in that video, but it's basically a very vibrant, um, bright, fresh flower that is supposed to symbolize in the Japanese culture and in the Buddhist culture, rebirth. And so it's supposed to symbolize this almost spiritual enlightenment rebirth of yourself and of the mind, right? You've been reborn into something higher than your human just form, right? Your earthly wants, let's say. And instantly, you're hit with a couple things. So when you smell this fragrance, 
if if you're keen on iris and if you know what beautiful iris smells like that's the first thing you're going to pick up is i mean the first minute or two i mean your jaw is just dropped because of the beauty of the iris then you're going to start noticing more and more things the floral opening um doesn't really smell like anything i've ever smelled before i can't necessarily it smell it says it smells like this vintage fragrance or that vintage fragrance um you know but i can tell you that the vibe that the fragrance feels like is that you're smelling something like a vintage Guerlain, okay? So if you've smelled some of the old school vintage Guerlains, you'll have an idea of the ballpark that this fragrance plays in. I could easily see Jacques Guerlain making this, right? Uh, it just, it, it's that sort of perfume. And um, the florals in the top are so vibrant and as a unit, they almost come together the florals combined it's almost like the florals are working together as a team as a cohesive unit and you just are you can sit back and just smell the beauty of the um of of the floral aspect of the of the fragrance once you get to the floral heart and just appreciate the beauty of the smell as a whole um Recently, Antoine Lee was discussing his new fragrance, um, Patchouli Noisette, which I cannot wait to smell one day from the house of Les Demo Dabla. And he was saying that a lot of fragrances he smells almost like a sphere, like this, this uh, perfume triangle that you see on a lot of these sites isn't necessarily how the ingredients come across. Sometimes it comes across as like a sphere. And here you get this um, almost like this cohesive floral unit that is just working together in amazingly beautiful fashion to, um, you know, for the first hour or so, you can sit back and you can just appreciate, wow, this is a beautiful floral opening on one hand, right? But on the other hand, if you want to go in there and sort of pick out the individual traits of each flower, you can do it. You can, you can sit there and try to die. You can get into big perfume nerd mode and pick out the, you know, uh, bits and pieces of the jasmine, or you can you can try to pick out the powdery aspects of the extremely high quality smelling iris, or sort of the rubbery, malleable feel of the yellow ylang ylang, and finally, you can pick out that soft, sweet, fruity, um, you know, that. Uh, um, smell of the Japanese uh, lotus flower. It has this soft, sweet, fruity, almost pure. Remember I said earlier there's this almost like re-birth um, to, the, to the flower that the, the Buddhists think about? There's almost this spiritual enlightenment of the flower, this rebirth from the Japanese water lily. And there's this purity to the smell as well. So with the powdery iris and with the rose and the jasmine and the ylang ylang, there's this very pure flower smell that just feels different. That's the Japanese water lily. And in the Buddhist culture, uh, it's almost like that flower is almost like a heavenly ordained flower. It, um, you know, when you see it, like I said, you see it floating on top of the lake or, or on floating on top of the water. And in the Buddhist culture, that is supposed to represent this uh, desire to float above your mere earthly wants and to, and to sort of um, take the next step and be reborn as your new self. You're no longer just Ramsey. You're now Ramsey, who sometimes they give you them a different name, obviously, once they've had this reawakening and there's somebody else. That happens in the Bible all the time. You know, God gave people different names whenever they were now converted to seeing the light or whatever you want to call it, right? So imagine that sort of ex that sort of experience and you are now floating above the world, looking down on your mortal self and you no longer have those earthly desires of the flesh or whatever you want to call them, right? Think of that's sort of the way that the Buddhists see the Japanese flower, uh, water lily. And it's interesting to me because this fragrance really has almost a clarity effect on the mind's eye. So one thing I noticed about the fragrance, and this is going to seem, um, I don't know what it might seem like to some people, but it's so stunningly beautiful that it doesn't blur the ability when you sort of just try and envision things that it's making you think about. This has a very nature, this has a very natural 
and it makes me think of being with nature. It makes me think of our place in nature, how humans are just one piece of this much bigger system, right? We are not um, islands onto ourselves. John Donne said that. No man is an island onto himself, right? And the other people around you, the environment that's going on around you, and everything influences who you are and all that good stuff, right? So uh, this fragrance doesn't blur your vision of what you're thinking about. It, it clarifies it somehow. And again, it may seem strange, but it's not like an idealized version of the past or of nature or whatever you're thinking about. When I smell this fragrance and I think about something, imagine watching like the beauty of a gazelle being born and then a minute or two into that gazelle's life, like a lion coming in and snatching it away, snatching its life away, right? And some might look at that and say, extremely cruel. Others might look at that and cheer on the lion. Um, but this fragrance, when you think about these type of nat natural events, you know, there's a beauty to just the, the clockwork of nature. And when you smell this and you really just sit back and think about them, it, it clarifies things for you. The way you see things in your mind's eye, this fragrance clarifies them. To me, it does. And again, that may seem like a very idealized, um, you know, thought process or, or artistic thought process, but just sort of accepting what you see as reality. There's no sugar coating with this fragrance. It really feels like you can look back at the past or look at nature and just believe what you're seeing. You know, there's a, there's a realness to this perfume that is really profound and beautiful. And so once the beauty of that floral heart starts to fade, what you're left with is this extremely solid base. And I mean solid in the, faith, in the fact that it feels like multiple generations and multiple minds, minds have been like working on this fragrance. Like imagine like a miner tink, tinking away at a mine, right? Or, or a clockmaker, um, you know, just trying to get the gears exactly perfect and the design exactly perfect. Um, and then passing it on to his son after he dies and he, he working on the same project, right? There is this, um, there's this heft, strong, solid foundation to the base. And like I said, it feels like generations of people worked on this, on this base. And the base is basically the base of this fragrance holding up this, um, this, this floral, this beautiful floral composition I talked about earlier is made up of basically a handful of materials. You have vetiver, you have sandalwood, you have cedar, and you have tonka. And the note that I would say comes most prominently to my nose, so outside of the beautiful iris opening, outside of that floral heart, which I said can work together as a cohesive unit, or you can really try to go into perfume nerd mode and, and pick everything out, is the patchouli in the base. The patchouli in the base, to me, is sort of the most prominent note that comes to my nose after the floral heart really starts to give way. And the, so the patchouli anchors the fragrance. About one hour in, you're gonna really start to notice the patchouli starts to turn up in intensity. And there is this headiness to the patchouli and by headiness I mean like uh, you know patchoulis are always associated with head shops and you know hippies and vintage feels there is a little bit of this vintage haunt side to the fragrance um, but not too much okay remember this is a classy fragrance this is vintage Guerlain style perfume okay so yes there is enough of of this headiness this to add this vintage tint to the perfume this brilliant vintage tint, but um, imagine taking that patchouli, which already patchouli can have this sort of textured feel to it, and adding this unbelievably uh, beautiful oak moss note. And the oak moss adds this cherished texture. You know, to me, oak moss always feels like you're walking straight into the tree, like the tree has a door, and you open it up, and instead of smelling the moss growing on the outside of the tree, you walk inside the tree. And the whole inside is just a loom, is just oak moss, and and you can and you can feel the inside of the oak moss, the texture on the inside with your hands, right? That's what oak moss adds to a composition. And modern noses, if all you've smelled is modern perfume, this will put you on your ass, literally. I mean, you won't know what to think. I, you'll 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 be you'll be over here, and then all of a sudden you'll be over there, and it's just you'll be all over the place. 
Um, this fragrance is this fragrance is a great teaching tool fragrance, I think, for someone who wants to learn what perfume used to be, you know, what it was in the good old days and why people like me go so insane for vintage fragrances and why we just go so crazy for it. Um, this is a great teaching tool, really tells a story. The sandalwood in the base is slightly creamy. It's extremely high quality smelling as well, along with the textured oak moss, but the unreal floral offering is not the only trick this fragrance has up its sleeve. And for some reason, every time I've sprayed this on, again, this is number three. This is the third time. This is the third time. Um, and I've worn it to bed. Um, and for some reason, every time, once I get to about that hour mark or so in the fragrance, the base starts to give off this incense vibe or feel. I have no clue, no clue where this incense feel is coming from. There's no incense listed in the notes. And um, so I just want you to imagine this. Imagine along with sort of the vintage tilt that I mentioned earlier to the fragrance, um, this incense base, which starts to rise, and it never really relents until basically the fragrance gives gives way eight ten hours in um it's an extra actually it may even be more than 10 hours to be honest with you because the quality of the ingredients feels so high here this fragrance feels like you know it just it just lasts and lasts and lasts not necessarily a beast mode it's not like interlude man where you're gonna smell it 24 hours later and it's just pumping off of your skin this fragrance will still be there but in a beautiful, soft, sort of alluring way. But what ends up happening is, because it's a Shepra, okay, um, it has this mossy, dirty, little bit of a dirty base to it, but there's also this incense feel. And surprisingly, the incense adds this so slightly waxy quality to the perfume. So you can smell the, the florals, obviously. Like right now, I can smell the spicy florals. Beautiful, combined together. Um, and I smell the sandalwood and the patchouli and the vetiver and all that stuff sort of combining into the base, but there's this incense-like feel. And I don't know where that little wispy incense note is coming from. It, you know what it feels like? It feels like Amouage made a fragrance in 1888. Now, Amouage wasn't a house until 1983 when Sultan uh, Bin Kaboos decided to create the house of Amouage. But this feels like Amouage made a fragrance in 1888, as if they were doing something like this, you know, these vintage Amouage bottles that have so much depth to them. If you've ever smelled these type of, the Amouage and the older flacons, um, there's, there's a little bit of, for some reason, that little incense whip, that frankincense, that Omani white frankincense feel. I don't know if it's just like some sort of a trick of the hemp because the patchouli has, you know, so much of this herbal, dark green, heady, you know, textured with the oak moss combined that it just gives off this a little bit of this slightly smokiness, slightly incense-y in, in the base, waxy incense almost, maybe like an unlit candle. Um, and that's why I think it almost feels like an homage made, made a perfume. Now, if you've been keeping score at home, 1888 is a very important year because in 1889, the very first modern perfume came out in Jiki. And I've talked about Jiki before. I need to do a full review on this one day. See, I want my channel to be, you know, there are places out there and not to bash anybody. Everyone has to make money, but you know, many people love Luca Turin and, and what he did for the fragrance industry. And there's no you know, denying his, his books and, but he always put all of his stuff behind a paywall. You know, it was like, I have all this information I want to share with the world, but only if you pay me. And I never want to do that. I mean, if you have to watch an ad or something, fine, but I want the experience to be open to everybody who is interested in perfume. I don't want there, I don't want to be hidden behind a paywall. I don't want to have some amazing, you know, site where I talk about all these fragrances, but you can't access it unless you pay. Um, and, and some of the sites even, I know there is a um, site that Michael Edwards, who is another extremely um, 
uh, respected name in the fragrance industry is creating where every single fragrance that him and his aides can add to this fragrance, it's supposed to be like a debt, like a database for the industry, for people who are in the industry. But I would love something like that, but apparently it's pretty expensive. You know, they want a lot of money per month to access this database. And so ultimately my goal is I want this channel to, and that's the reason why I do less live streams than let's say the average person in my shoes. I And I still love doing live streams. There will be more live streams on the channel. I'm not gonna stop doing live streams, but I feel like sometimes with live streams, um, it, they just get kind of pushed aside like the people watch it currently and they like being able to interact and stuff but then it just gets thrown to the side not not as many people go back and watch the live streams i don't feel like the video i feel like it's there you know it's focused on a fragrance and this will be titled um gross smith perfumes hasu no hana uh from 1888 and people will be able to search for it when they search for that on youtube this will come up and that's what i want I almost want my channel to be a little bit of a database of my thoughts on these fragrances because there should be a little bit more out there. It shouldn't be hidden. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me, when uh, I I think about things like Jiki coming out in, in 1889, technically, if this came out one year before, you could easily make the case that while, yes, this is supposed to be a representation of the Japanese water lily. Maybe it didn't have a true, you know, artistic idea like Jiki did um, with its hesperitic fresh lavender and slightly animalic base. Um, this feels like a very competent artistic perfume. And if this is true that this came out one year before in, in a form like this, I, I would almost argue that this was the first modern perfume. But then again, people could say, well, technically then you could go back even further. And so the debate really never gets gets uh, ended. But I will say that capturing timeless beauty, I don't think I've smelled much better than this. This is absolutely stunning. I am, I am on the floor. This fragrance put me on the floor um, and makes me really want to smell more from this house. Jeff, if you're watching, do please uh, leave a comment. Uh, clarifying whether this is from the modern version because this is the eau de parfum by the way i should mention this comes in an eau de parfum and an eau de toilette and so i'll just read you the little blurb it says the scent of the japanese lotus lily a bright radiant composition with pronounced shipra and amber facets on a woody dry very sensual base yes very sensual because it smells like incense um Hasu Nohana hailed the dawn of modern creative perfumery. Ah, I didn't even know they wrote that, but I was just thinking that when we were talking about Jiki. Uh, originally created in 1888, this scent has a timeless quality which comes from its pioneering spirit. So the Eau de Parfum, the modern stuff, okay, the modern stuff, from uh, for 50 mils, it runs you 210 uh, pounds, which is not that bad, actually. I mean, that is expensive, but it's not that bad compared to what some modern niche fragrances go for. 100 mils, 295 pounds. So you can actually get the bigger bottle um, for not that much more money, not even 100 bucks more. Uh, so the 100 mils, a much better deal per mil, of course. But um, yes, I... If anyone has smelled this, uh, I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts. You know, this is um, this is a channel where I try my best to respond to every single comment. So if you do leave me a comment on this, you will hear back from me, you know, and uh, I really appreciate the support. I know that these type of sort of surgical strike videos on a specific fragrance from 1888, you really have to be into perfume to, um, to, to go this deep. Some people see these videos, they don't even bother clicking on it. But if you're interested in learning about new fragrances, obviously, somebody left me a message once and said, I'll never be able to smell that anyway, so what's the point? And, you know, some some there may be some truth to that. Maybe you will never be able to smell this. But if you want to sort of get your base, remember I was talking about how the base of this fragrance feels so solid, foundational, you know? Um, if you want to get your base and knowledge of perfume history up to date, you should learn about stuff you've never smelled. What if you get to smell this one day? Then you'll know about it, right? That's sort of the idea. 
And but there are different levels. I know not everyone is as into perfume as we are. Very few people are as into perfume as as we are, right? Um, so there are different levels of perfume interest. But uh, this is one of those foundational pieces. Like I talk about, you know, things like um, Mitsuko, right? Something like Mitsuko. This is a late '70s bottle, according to the great Anuj. And um, so there are just some foundational fragrances that I've talked about previously, Roche Ass Femme, um, Shalimar, you know, the list goes on, Le Bleu, and all the old Guerlains you should definitely smell, but, but there are others to discuss as well from the past, but this is one that is going on that list. This is one that is, is for me, it's going on that foundational list of, of perfume. If you want to really understand where we came from, how we got to where we are, this should go on your to sniff list, even if you just get a little sample, like um, like Jeff very kindly sent me. So this has been a hell of a video for me to do. I have really, really enjoyed it. You can see how excited I was just to make the video, how much energy I had to do this. I have a lot of time for these type of scents. And um, it's just, the whether you like florals or not, of course, as I drop it, whether you like Sheepras or not, whether you like, you know, mossy fragrances or not, or patchouli fragrances or not, or whatever it is, you should still try and, and smell this if you're really into sort of going through perfume archaeology, if you will, going back in time and sort of studying the the way that one fragrance jumped to another, jumped to another, and how and how we basically got to where we are. This is one to definitely sniff. So it's been an absolute pleasure. I very much appreciate you guys watching. Do leave a comment. Um, cheers, guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.